Uh, thanks so much, Jim, and thanks to everybody. Uh, it's really an honor to be standing here, um, and really my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the work that this foundation professorship uh, will support. Uh, so what, I, what I'm interested in are these things called functional gastrointestinal disorders. And the reason that I'm interested in these is because these are among the most common chronic medical conditions known to man, and they affect about 25% of humans. So that's a huge number of people worldwide. And there's really no good cure for these things, and there's no good therapy. Um, the cost of uh, just IBS, for example, so IBS is the abbreviation for irritable bowel syndrome, is on the order of uh, $30 billion a year in the United States. And so if you can extrapolate that now to the whole world, uh, it's a lot of people and a lot of money. Uh, so these are typically things that affect uh, the gut, so inflammatory bowel diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, things like slow transit constipation. Uh, but we're becoming to appreciate now that uh, gastrointestinal problems are also associated with a number of other disorders like diabetes, Parkinson's, obesity, and Alzheimer's. And a lot of times the GI complications are more, uh, more detrimental to daily life uh, than some of the other problems these people have. So what's causing all these problems? So when I have a difficult problem, I usually think about going kayaking. Uh, but I'm usually thinking about going kayaking, so it's, this is fine. So, <laughs> you know, in this case, it's actually useful uh, because kayaking is a good analogy for about everything in life, I've decided. Uh, so I know this is a stretch, but if you can imagine that this river here is an intestine, and these two guys here, this is me and this is my son Gabe over here kayaking, are a couple of cells in this intestine. You can see what happens when uh, these two, two things communicate well. And really it all breaks down to uh, things communicating well in your gut. So this is an example of things communicating well. Usually when we're talking to each other, things are working out well. You can see things move down the intestine pretty good. Uh, but when we're not communicating so well, so the guy in the blue boat there didn't tell his son in the, in the uh, orange boat that there was a big hole, uh, you can see <laughs> things get a little bit more complicated and you can get backups, right? Things don't work. Okay, so the same thing happens in your gut. And it takes a lot of little cells talking to each other the right way for things to move down the gut the right, uh, right way and for all these things to be co uh, coordinated. So these two videos that you're looking at here are actually pieces of animal intestine. And so these are from a guinea pig. And so the one on the left there is a piece of colon and the one on the right is a piece of ileum. And so what you're watching in this dish are a couple of the basic reflexive activities of the gut. And it's able to do all these things by itself without any input from the brain or spinal cord because the gut has all the cells needed uh, talking to each other uh, in the walls of the gut itself. So the most important part of this uh, is the little brain of the gut, as Jim alluded to. And so this is called the enteric nervous system. And so we have about 100 million neurons in the walls of our gut. So it's a huge component of the nervous system and about as big as a cat's brain. Uh, so most of the focus in the field over the uh, last century or so has been focused on these neurons and the way the neurons are talking to each other. Uh, but like Jim said, there's another cell type in the nervous system that surrounds these cells called glia. And these glia were classically thought of as these quiet, passive cells that just provided support for the neurons. Uh, but we didn't think that was true, and so we've been uh, asking more questions about what these cells are doing and so these glial cells, it turns out, are pretty neat. They're a different type of cell. They're not like any other type of cell found in the body, but they share characteristics to some of the different types of glia uh, that are kind of sister cells that are in the brain and the spinal cord. And so we've used some of uh, what we know about those types of cells to think about how we know that glial cells work. So what we found out about these glia is that neurons actually talk to glia. And this was a major finding in the field because we thought that these cells were just passive. But then once we understood that neurons were talking to glia, that opened up the door for a lot of other questions about what were these glia doing and could they talk back to other cell types or influence different functions. And so these two videos that are cycling here are just showing a couple of different uh, videos of calcium imaging. And so these things flashing away there, those are actually the enteric glial cells. And so this Little thing outlined here, this is an enteric ganglion, and this is an enteric ganglion from a mouse. And all those green things or blue things on the left lighting up are glia. And so those neurons are talking to glia here. And so over the past couple of years, we've asked, okay, well, the neurons are talking to glia. How about the glia talking back? 
And what we found is, yes, the glia do talk back, and they actually tell the neurons to tell the gut to contract more. And so we can increase contractions by influencing the activity of glial cells. Uh, we've also found that the glia tell different types of neurons uh, that are influencing the mucosa uh, to secrete uh, more fluid out into the lumen of the gut. So the glia are telling different types of neural circuits in the gut to tell the gut to contract more and to secrete more fluid. And what we've also found is under special conditions in inflammation, uh, those glia can actually change and they can kill off different types of neurons if those neurons aren't functioning correctly. And those glia can make the executive decision that this neuron is too far gone, we need it out of there, and they can kill those neurons off. And then lately what we found uh, more interesting actually is that glia talk to the immune system and they provide this bridge between neurons and the immune system and glia can actually sense when neurons are sick, when there's an invasion of bacteria around the nervous system and the gut, and they can call in different types of immune cells uh, to clear out these different types of uh, problems. And the immune cells themselves can influence glia, and things that these immune cells are releasing can alter the, uh, the way these glial cells function and can change the type of glia that are there. And then these glial cells work differently than they normally would. And we think that these are some of the key cellular events that cause the gut basically to not work in functional GI disorders. So we think that understanding these uh, mechanisms in more, detail, uh, uh, in more detail is going to lead to new therapies for common disorders like irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel diseases. So I just want to finish by thanking a lot of people that have helped me out. So first and foremost, thank you my family for supporting me in my kayaking and, and science hobbies. And uh, I want to extend a, a huge thank you to my lab whoop, here. So my lab back there, most of them have actually come. And so these are the people that are doing uh, the work day to day and are really responsible for all the work that you saw. Uh, and you know, I, I couldn't have done this without, without all their support and their hard work. So I owe them a huge thanks. They've been great. I have a great crew of people in there. Um, of course, I want to uh, thank the Michigan State University Foundation. It's a huge honor to be chosen as a foundation professor, and I uh, hope I can live up to the expectations of that. Um, I also want to uh, thank the College of Natural Science, the MSU Neuroscience Program, and the MSU Department of Physiology. Uh, all three have been huge supporters, and getting started at MSU and conducting research here uh, has really been a pleasure, and it wouldn't have been possible without people like Jim Kirkpatrick, Jim Galligan, and Lee Cox, who have supported both my professional development and my research program as I've gotten going. Uh, so thank you all.